Eric, uh, you can go ahead. Okay, thank you. So we thank the Lord once again for the opportunity that he has granted us to see this Sabbath and uh, for the first program. Uh, so we want to proceed with the uh, second program on uh, justification by faith, which we want to look at uh, sanctified by the word. So before we proceed, uh, we will kneel and bow our heads wherever we are so that we can ask the Lord for his blessings before we continue. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we are before you once again to thank you for the opportunity that you have granted us once again, that we might be able to delve into your word, Father, that has transforming power. May your Holy Spirit open our minds, Father, and our, stand, and our understanding, that we might be able to grasp, Father, the fullness of the promises and power that you have given us through your word, that they might be able to transform us, Father, that you might be able to be fit citizens for your kingdom and draw others further to your kingdom. Be with us for this program and even for the rest of the programs. For these are prayer, trusting and believing in the precious name of Christ. Amen. So we were looking at uh, uh, true sanctification last uh, time. And uh, we looked at some comments that were very interesting from the spirit of prophecy. And uh, that is what we want to continue with today. And uh, just try and deeply understand the, the gems that we have uh, in the spirit of prophecy. This making clear of the Bible, the, the words of scripture, that is a privilege that we have been granted as uh, those who have accepted this faith. And uh, therefore we will continue, we are looking at Desire of Ages 675-76, we'll go to 677. But maybe before we begin, so that we get the title for today's uh, study, we want to look at the words of Christ in the book of John 17. John 17 from uh, verse 12. From verse 12 to 17. It says, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture may be fulfilled. And now notice in 13, he says, and now come I to thee. So he's saying he's about to leave the disciples and go back to his father. And these things I speak in the world, that they might have, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. 14, I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. 15, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. Then 16, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. And 17, where it says that sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Sanctify them through uh, thy truth. Thy word is truth. Now notice in 14, I have given them thy word. So there is a relationship, there is a connection here between Christ 13 saying, now I come unto thee. So when he was going to be physically removed from his disciples, what were the disciples to remain with for their sanctification? In 14 it says, I have given them thy word. 
And in 17, it says that sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is what? Thy word is truth. Now, last time we were looking at where Christ was saying that he is the vine and we are the branches. And we saw how sanctification comes by us abiding in him and him abiding in us. And then as long as we are attached to him, the sap from the roots will be going up to the branches. But if we lose that connection, then it means that we will not be able to do what? We will not be able uh, to produce uh, fruit. And that is the connection that I want us to look at today together with that of uh, the word. So we want to continue our study of sanctification by looking at this text again, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. It says, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such, there is no what? No law. Fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against which there is no law. Now we know that fruit is what you have when you have grown up. Actually, we saw in John 15, 5, where Christ was saying that he that abideth in me and I in you, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, he can, he can do nothing. 15, 5, eh? yeah. So he's talking about abiding in him and him in us, the result will be what? The bringing of much, the bringing of much fruit. What is this fruit? What we have read in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Against which we are told there is no law. Now we are saying that fruit is what you have when you have fully grown up, when you have matured. It is the harvest, what the farmer harvests after a season of taking care of his plants until maturity. So the fruit of the spirit is another way of describing sanctification. It is the end, at least the end result of sanctification. Because if you have all these things that have been mentioned here, love, joy, peace, long suffering, you will agree with me that you will have very little problem in this world. It takes care of so many, so many things. So this is another way of talking about sanctification. What we want to look at is how do you produce this fruit, which I think we touched on last time before we look at how the word actually comes in. Now we go back to the book Desire of Ages 677. 677. So that we answer the question, do we work to produce this fruit of the spirit. There is a sentence there, 677, that says, yet the savior does not bid. Yet the savior does not bid. Yes. The disciples labor to bear fruit. He tells them to do what? To abide in him. Their work in order to produce the fruit was not to labor to produce the fruit and to bear the fruit, but their work was to abide in who? In Christ. Here is where he talks about being the vine and us being the what? The branches. If we abide in him and him in us, the same can bring forth much fruit because without him, 
can be able to do nothing. So Ellen White here is saying that the Lord does not bid us to labor to bring forth all the fruit that are mentioned in Galatians 5. Rather, we are to abide in him and him in us, then we are able to produce what? To produce fruit. Now, this is Christian maturity, the fullness of the stature of Christ as spoken of in Galatians 4. And there are various ways of looking at sanctification. That is both the growth and the ultimate result. But we want to look today at how the word of God uh, comes in. But if you remember again in John 15, 5, where Christ is saying that if we abide in him and him in us, we will bring forth much fruit. If you look at verse 7, verse 7 says, if you abide in me, some if we could just go to verse 7. John 15, verse 7, yes. Where I notice it says, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. So instead here of saying, if I abide in you, he's saying, if my words abide in you. So there is a, a, an exchange there of Christ himself abiding in us and his words abiding in what? In us. Now there is the desire of ages, quote that clears this up. Desire of ages, page 660, 677. where it starts by saying it is through the word. Yeah. Notice Eleanor is saying that it is through the word that Christ abides in his followers. Through the, the word that Christ abides in his followers. So through the word, he abides in us. Jesus told that when he abides in us, his word abides in us and we will bear much fruit. And this abiding is through his word, through the Bible. And when we read the Bible, and when he abides in us through the Bible, marvelous things, we are told, happen, which lead to the production of what? Of fruit, what we have just read when we were starting in John 17, 17. He prays, and at the end of that prayer in 17, he says, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is what? Is truth. If you look at verse 19, he says, and for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. So you find that this word of God does something great in our hearts and our lives. It has the power, it has the ability, it has the effectiveness to sanctify us if it abides in what? If it abides in us. Now, how exactly does this happen because there are so many people who read the Bible, who have had knowledge of the Bible, but they do not appear to be what? To be sanctified. They do not have the fruit that we have read uh, Paul speaks about in Galatians 5. So what, how exactly does this uh, sanctification happen through the word? What is the process that uh, takes place for this to happen? Back to Desire of Ages, page uh, 677. Desire of Ages 677. Yeah, that paragraph. Now from the top. Herein is my Father glorified, said Jesus, that you bear much fruit. God desires to manifest through you the holiness, the benevolence, the compassion of his own character. Yet the Savior does not bid the disciples labor to bear fruit. He tells them to abide in him. If you abide in me, he says, and my words abide in you, 
You shall ask what you will, and it shall, done, shall be done unto you. Then notice what he says, that it is through the word that Christ abides in his followers. This is the same vital union that is represented by eating his flesh and drinking his blood. Remember that time. The words of Christ are spirit and life. Receiving them, you receive the life of the vine. You live by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God, Matthew 4.4. 4. The life of Christ in you produces the same fruits as in him. Living in Christ, adhering to Christ, supported by Christ, drawing nourishment from Christ, you bear fruit after the similitude of Christ. So we are to live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So what happens as we feast upon his word and live by it? Something happens to us called living in Christ, adhering to Christ, supported by Christ. And we draw the nourishment from who? From Christ. The, then the result is that we bear fruit just like, just like him. So here we see that how the word sanctifies us is a unique thing. We have to go beyond more than just reading the Bible. It is more than studying different topics in the Bible, although that one also is uh, necessary in this process. It is more than understanding doctrines and concepts. It is more than a mental acceptance of the fact that the Bible is, is truth. Because having the word abiding in us means receiving Christ in his word. The end result is not to receive the word, but Christ through the word, through the word. Just getting him right inside, inside of us. It is different than getting concepts and ideas and theories in our minds because something must take place we must seek Christ in his word. And as we abide in him through his word, we are transformed into his image. So this is what should happen to us. And as you do this, you are told that we will not be struggling to bear fruit on our own. As you partake of Christ through his word, you abide in him. The natural result is that we will be able to bear fruit. So Jesus, remember in Luke 4.4, 4, Jesus, when he says to Satan, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of who? Of God. Because in that word of God, there is life. The enabling power, the stimulating power that motivates, as well as the principles of everlasting life are found in that, in that word of God. This is what the Lord wants us to realize and to do what? And to experience. Notice what Ellen White continues to say in the book, Desire of Ages, page 390. Desire of Ages, 390. Where it starts by saying, the life of Christ that gives life. Yes. The life of Christ that gives life to the world is in his word. It was by his word that Christ healed disease and cast out demons. By his word, he stilled the sea and raised the dead. And the people bore witness that his word was with power. He spoke the word of God as he had spoken through all the prophets and teachers of the Old Testament. The whole Bible is a manifestation of Christ. Manifestation of Christ. And the Savior desired to fix the faith of his followers on the word. No wonder when he was leaving his disciples, he leaves them with this word. Notice this last sentence where it says that when his visible presence should be withdrawn, when his visible presence should be withdrawn, the word must be their source of power. I thought it was the comfort, the Holy Spirit. So you see the relationship between the Spirit and the, the Word. Because here we are told very clearly that when his visible presence should be withdrawn, the Word must be their source of what? Of power reminds me 
by the way of uh, that introduction, maybe we can look at it, some introduction to the book, The Great Controversy. The introduction to the book, The Great Controversy. Great Controversy, uh, chapter one, yes, which I found to be very strange when I uh, actually read off the, the, the book, when I got it in somebody's uh, house. And I wondered why I even forgot about, if you read this, this introduction part, Ellen White is very clear and uses the word spirit of God, Holy Spirit up to the end. But anyway, what I want to talk about now is uh, the paragraph that says what the, the spirit was not given. The spirit was not given. Hmm? It's paragraph uh, five, a few paragraphs down. Yeah, the spirit was not given, nor can it ever be bestowed to supersede the Bible. For the scriptures explicitly state that the word of God is the standard by which all teaching and experience must be tested. So it says here, the spirit was not given, nor can it ever be bestowed to supersede the Bible to set aside the Bible as inferior, to replace the Bible. For the scriptures explicitly state that the word of God is the standard by which all teaching and experience must be, must be tested. Says the apostle John, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. And Isaiah declares to the Lord the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no, no light in them. Then she goes uh, down there to say how great reproach has been cast upon the work of the Holy Spirit by a class that claim to have its enlightenment and need no further guidance from the word of God. So you can see the relationship between the spirit and the word and the word and how important the word is, even in the work of the Holy Spirit. The word is to sanctify us. It is the standard by which all our teaching and experience must be tested. In that introduction part, you will find nowhere where Ellen White says God the Holy Spirit. It refers to the Spirit of God in the times of the Old Testament and the New Testament and how it will be restored in great abundance in the finishing of this work. It is the Spirit of who? Of God. Anyway, sanctified by the Spirit is what we were discussing. The last uh, line in Desire of Ages 390, when his visible presence should be withdrawn, the word must be their source of what? Of power. So Christ is here endeavoring to fix the attention of the disciples on the Bible when he shall be physically taken away. He wanted the Bible to be their source of power. There are two words in the Bible, the written word and the spoken word. Christ is called the word, and the Bible is also called the word, the word of God. So the above quote continues down there, that like their masters, they were to live by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of who? Of God. So there is something different about this, this word. There is some uniqueness in these words that are in the Bible or the Bible as the word of, of God. It is a different book. When Christ used to speak, spies were sent to listen to him, and then they come back and they say, never a man speak like this man. They were not only amazed by what he said, being literally true, but it is because there was a power in those words. In those words. This is the same person who spoke the, all things into existence by the power of his word of his mouth. You will find in Genesis when it says, let there be light, there was what? There was light. 
So these are ones that are coming from a different being from human beings who are created beings. This is the being that is speaking words in the scriptures, other than the people who speak or write those, those words in other uh, books. So we see here that as we abide by faith in Christ through his word, there is a different power in, this, in these words. So it must be read and studied in a different way from how we study other books that are written by men in this world. In John 6, 53, that we had mentioned, when Christ said, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. In verse 63, he says, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are what? They are life. Eat it, absorb the words, assimilate them into your body, get it inside of you. They are just more, they are not just thoughts and concepts that are to be, like he mentions in another place, put in the outside of the holy place of our soul. They must be taken into the most holy place of our what? Of our soul. So we have to absorb and assimilate them. There is a power that comes when we do this, comes from these words being that they are words that come from a divine being. So in order to be sanctified by the word of God, we must do something different with it than we do with most books that we read in school and colleges. It is more than studying and reading and what? And understanding. It is reading and studying with the purpose of having Christ come into us through those words. Let us look at the case of Nicodemus in the book John 3, 4. Nicodemus had an unusual experience that can help us understand this. John 3, 4, when Nicodemus came to Christ with questions, Christ responds to him in John 3, 4 by saying, I mean, Nicodemus actually responds to Christ explaining things of the kingdom. And he asks in John 3, 4, how can a man be born when he is what? When he is old. So Nicodemus is confused. And Jesus answers in verse 10, art thou a what? A master of Israel and knowest not these things? I mean, notice how Christ's rebuke were soft, huh? but still, if you look at them, they were still uh, rebuke. Now notice that Nicodemus was a member of the Sanhedrin. And for you to become a member of the Sanhedrin, it was necessary for you to have memorized great portions of scripture. He was a scholar. Once he became admitted to the Sanhedrin, this was a scholar. Many people knew that these are the people who understand the scriptures. He understood all things, salvation. Yet when he comes to Christ, they are not communicating. Why? Christ is asking him, are you not a, a scholar of the scriptures? One of the elite in Israel and Judah. And you do not, you are telling me you do not understand the basic elements of Christianity. How have you missed it when you've been spending your time reading the scriptures? Desire of Ages 174 speaks about this. Notice what Ellen White says. Desire of Ages 174, in which we can apply to our experience also, because we read these stories in the Bible and we do not see, we, we don't actually get into the minds of the characters concerned, like here. What do you think was wrong with Nicodemus? Ellen White is saying, Nicodemus, where it says, Nicodemus had read the scriptures with a clouded mind. So prior to meeting Christ, Nicodemus was a scholar. He had memorized great portions of scripture. But the problem here, we are told that he had read them with a clouded what? A clouded mind. Something was wrong with his reading. But after this discussion where those unique ideas were proposed to him, we are told, it continues to say, that he searched the scriptures in a new way. 
Nicodemus searched the scriptures in a new way. Page 175. Yeah, down, down. Search the scriptures in a new way. I think it's very, it's a very important line that I want us to get. Page 175. Yes. In fact, let us read the, the whole paragraph. Not through controversy and discussion is the soul enlightened. We must look and live. Nicodemus received the lesson and carried it with him. He searched the scriptures in a new way, not for the discussion of a theory, but in order to receive life for the world, for the soul. He began to see the kingdom of heaven as he submitted himself to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Vast different, vast difference with the attitude that he, prior to this experience, came to in order to study the scriptures. This is also to us who study the scriptures. Do we study the scriptures for the discussion of a theory? Do we study it to prove ourselves right just in a discussion? Or do we study it so that we can get life for our own? for our souls. So something happened to Nicodemus and he started looking at the scriptures in a vastly different way. He started for life for his soul and he submitted to be led by the spirit of, of God. Two things here. Now this quote gives us great insight into how we are to study our Bible in a new way and how to be sanctified by the word of, of God. It tell, the word tells us how and what to do. And we, like Nicodemus, are to study the word of God to receive life for the soul, and we are to also submit to be led by the Spirit of who? The Spirit of God, who works through the same word, through the same word. The book of Education, uh, page 126. Education, 126. the creative energy that called the worlds into existence. The creative energy that called the worlds into existence is in the word of God, yes. The creative energy, not is creative, it achieves creative uh, power when it goes out. The creative energy that called the worlds into existence is in the word of God. This word imparts power, it begets life. Every command is a promise. What God commands us in the Bible is not so that we can run, we can run on our own and try to achieve it using our own strength. It says the command is a promise. There is a promise behind it and the power to accomplish it. Every command is a promise accepted by the will, received into the soul. It brings with it the life of the infinite. So God's words are promises and we, we accept them by the will and receive them into our souls, it brings with it the life of the infinite. So as you receive thoughts into your mind and understanding, you must go beyond that. And what is the next step here? Do I accept it with my will? Not my intellect, but my will. Am I willing to do what I have understood the word is saying? Do I do more? than say I think it is right. 
just saying that I believe that Christ was the son of God. I mean, do you, you have to go a step further. So what about that? What did he come to do upon this earth? To die for sinners. And I'm part of the sinners that he died for. So do I get to a point where I want to do what the word says, is what we are being told here. There are choices. The word will, after accepting it, there are choices that will give, it will give to you that you must be able to do what? To make. And the choice is that we must be able to receive every command into our innermost beings. And when we do that, it comes with creative power that makes me a different person, which I desperately want to be. Back to the book, Desire of uh, Ages, page 389, about eating the flesh and drinking the blood of Christ. Len White comments on that. Desire of Ages 389. To eat the flesh and drink the blood. Yes, the paragraph down there. To eat the flesh and drink the blood of Christ is to receive him as a personal savior. What does it mean, a personal savior? You personalize what you read in the word. It applies to you. It does not apply to my neighbor. It does not apply to my neighbor on the right or on the left. It does not apply to the minister and to other people. I am reading it for my sake first. I personalize what I read. So to eat the flesh and drink the blood of Christ is to receive him as a personal savior, believing that he forgives our sins and that we are complete in him. It is by beholding his love, by dwelling upon it, by drinking it in, that we are to become partakers of his nature. What food is to the body, Christ must be to the soul. Food cannot benefit us unless we eat it, unless it becomes a part of our being. Christ is of no value to us if we do not know him as a personal savior. A theoretical knowledge will do us no good. We must feed upon him, receive him into the heart so that his life becomes our life. His love, his grace must be assimilated. So what is those terms about eating, digesting, absorbing, assimilating, his love and grace feeding upon him, receiving him into my heart so his life becomes my very own, my very life. Sometimes we think that we, if we read the word a bit here and have some theoretical knowledge, that that is what is going to bring the word, the sanctification. But if we leave the word in the outer court without bringing him, bringing it, into the most holy place of our souls, that creative power will not be able to transform us. We must do more than just take a short look at, at the one. We must reach out and embrace the whole thing so that we can do more than just think about it. The will must be able to, call, to be called into action in receiving and accepting what the word demands of us. The soul must receive it then Christ will come to live his life in you as you study his word in a new way, like it happened to Nicodemus. So things will begin to happen as you have communion with Christ through his word. Sanctification goes even beyond that. There is this book, My Life Today, MLT, page 261, where something else is also brought to view by the servant of the Lord. There is the paragraph that says, the truth of God is to sanctify the soul. The truth of God is to sanctify the soul. The sanctifying power of truth is to abide in the soul and be carried with us to our busyness, there to apply its continual tests to every transaction of life, especially to our dealings with our fellow men. It is to abide in our households, having a subduing power upon the life and character of all its inmates, 
I must ever urge upon, upon those who profess to believe the truth, the necessity of practicing the truth. This means sanctification, says the servant of the Lord. And sanctification means the culture and training of every capability for the service of who? For the service of the Lord. Now here we are seeing that sanctification, although we read it, assimilate the words of Christ and bring them into our innermost parts of the soul, whereby they come with this transforming power, it must go beyond that. It is not just something that is going to be in us without coming out. It is more than just eating the Bible or the word or the word. A true Christian cannot live only to eat. The eating of the word is good, yes. Just like eating of physical food is a good thing. But it must be used properly. We must eat to live. And spiritually, we must eat the word in order to live. And this life does not just mean keeping my heart beating and my lungs breathing. It means I eat to work and to be what? And to be active. Life is action. It produces action. And so I eat and life comes into me by the word. I become active by the word because it directs me and it involves me and it empowers me. This action must take place. And this goes beyond acceptance into the soul and into the will because it must be manifested outwardly again. So those are just intermediate steps, but it leads here that the servant of the Lord has told us, all that gets into me and does something into me must again be seen outwardly. It must sanctify the soul. It must be carried with us to a business. In your business, you will do what the word of God says. Not having diverse weights and standards and conning people for a larger profit. In school, you will not be cheating in exams. You see things like that. In, in, in where else? In life, you will be interacting with human fellow human beings like brothers and sisters whom Christ also did what? Died for. In your household, it will be seen in how you treat the members of your family. There will be seen a subduing power in your life and character. So once you get this word inside, we are seeing it is not just going to stay there. You make it your business to implement it at the job and at school and at your business. You bring it into effect. You must not leave it at charge. Like in the Sabbath school, you discuss, this is what we should be doing. I've seen this so many times. And you say that, you know, if this is what we have read, then it means that even in our programs, we should not be doing one, two, three, because it goes against this. In the Sabbath school, after that, it is business as usual. You wonder. Now, this is what we are being told. We must be able to practice. After we have brought this word into our will, we must be able, through the power that it comes with, to bring it in our businesses, with the people in school and in church and everywhere we go, because we are seeing sanctification is not just a theory that gets into the mind and stays there. You are not sanctified because you have that theory in your mind. It becomes part of you. It must come out too. You are not the source of it, but Christ will abide in you because he is sanctifying you through his word, because you are reading his word in a different way than you were reading it before. So this life must come out uh, through you. So this obedience, basically what we, are, we have read, is what we would call obedience. Because this is the next step. We absorb the word, we receive it, assimilate it, and then we do it. And here in obedience is where now we have problems. Because remember, what the word says, the word of God says, we ought to do, which is obedience. That is where we have problems like we've been reading throughout. That, oh, that is what all that you have said, Lord, we will do like the Israelites of old. We will obey. We think that we can do it on our what? On our own. So we get into this ditch of saying, well, all that you have said, we will do what? We will obey. Notice that we've been reading throughout that that is not what uh, 
That is not the work that God has given us. To produce fruit, your work is to abide. To be sanctified by the word is, means that we must receive Christ in his word. In his word. And then he is the one who will make this obedience even possible. Now let us look at Ministry of Healing, page 136, what it says about uh, how obedience plays a part in sanctification. Ministry of Healing, page 136, where it says, just to the degree in which the word of God is received. Yes. Notice what it says here. That just to the degree in which the word of God is received and obeyed, will it impress with its potency and touch with its life every spring of action, every face of character. It will purify every thought, regulate every word, every desire. So what is Ellen White saying here? That these things that she has said, purifying of every thought and regulating of desires, these things happen just to the degree that I receive and obey the word, and obey the word. So without reception, it does not get inside. And without obedience, it does not get outside. Without both reception and obedience, there is no sanctification. So without the obedience and only the reception, it is only a false pretense kind of Christianity. It is a false profession. No one is going to be able to see it. And we do not look much different from the other people who do not even believe in Christ Jesus. No matter how hard we do it, we try. So this is a different kind of utilization of the word than we have in a math class or reading a book of instruction. It is a different sort of thing. In school, you only have to say you agree with what the book says. And you get the thing correct. But now we have to do something else here. We must not only agree with what it says, but it must come into the will, into the soul, into the heart. Even the virtues of Christ, we are told, his love and his grace must come inside and be assimilated. And there it becomes a spring of action and motivation in the world, in the life. Then, because my will has accepted it, I will will to do his will. Once you submit your will to his will, action will take place, motivated by his presence in your life. Then comes obedience, which is that action that shows sanctification is doing what is taking place. Very interesting thoughts ah, indeed. So we are told in John 14, 15, that if we love Christ, then we keep his word, his commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, 15, keep my commandments. All through the Bible, by the way, the Lord is just saying, follow me, because he does not demand that we follow him. He does not, take, he does not force us. He does not also restrict us. He only asks if we will choose to do what? To follow him. John 14, if he, say, he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. He does not say that you have to love him, that you must love me. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. He does not say that we have to obey him. He only says that if you do not love him, the other way of saying him, of saying this, if you do not love me, you will not keep my word, you will not keep my commandments. You will not obey if you do not love. It is such text that we read and say that to show my love to Jesus, then I must keep his word, I must keep his commandments in my own strength. So we, we turn it the other way around that I must do it. Yet that is not what the text is saying. He says, obey if you love him. Obey if you love me, keep my word, keep my commandments. If you do not love him, 
then do not obey him. Because it is, by the way, and it is going to be impossible to render genuine obedience to Christ if you do not love him, although sometimes you think that it is possible. Jesus says that if you love him, then accept his instructions because we know that they are wonderful instructions. And if we love him because we are reciprocating in that we have seen his love when we were yet sinners, he died for us, then we will follow him lovingly. It is nice to follow someone that you love. It is difficult to follow someone that you do not do what? You do not love. So we will struggle in keeping the commandments if we are not filled with the love of who? With the love of Christ and what he did for us in order to save us from sin. So we do not do what is right in order to be good enough to be saved. To be saved. Hmm? It is not trying to earn our way to heaven. It is serving him because we love him supremely with all our heart and mind and what? And strength. All other motivations we see are not right and are wrong. If you look at uh, what the Bible actually says and many quotes in the spirit of prophecy about commandments and obeying, we also read them the same way we read such texts. We find that maybe we start by Obedience, obedience in our own strength. We look at our activities and our works and we gauge ourselves how we are doing and compare ourselves with others, uh, probably. But we have seen in our studies that the Lord says we are to be holy and abide in him if we love him. Loving comes first, then obeying and not the other way around because it is loving and this response of love that will enable us to assimilate all the promises that are behind those uh, admonitions to do what? To obey. Otherwise, if we keep checking ourselves and doing right things because we think we are going to earn his love, then we are only moralists. So it is a matter of do you love him and does he love you? Will a particular activity be nice? If you are living with somebody you love, you don't think of many things. You only think of who is Am I doing what is uh, acceptable to the person I do, to the person I love? Am I sure, is this action that I'm doing going to show my love for the person or, or not? So it has to be a love affair. What I'm doing, is it going to annoy, to annoy the person if it's a human being, you get annoyed? Is it going to alienate Jesus? Or is it going to draw me closer uh, to Jesus? So most of these uh, commands that we are given in Scripture on what we ought not to do and what we ought to do, when we have dwelt too uh, much on them and when we live out the love of Christ, which makes it all right or wrong in the first place, that is why, that is why I think, believe that you are told then we had preached the law until we were dry as the hills of what? Of Gilboa. If we love Christ, we will do the right things. We have to look at Jesus and behold him and not always at our works, no matter how good or bad they may be. So this we find is the way Jesus lived, submitting his will to that of the Father. In the book John 14, 10, in the book John 14, 10, where he says to Philip, Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Christ did not decide what words to say and what works to do but that the Father was taking care of all that. The Father spoke and acted through him. And therefore, if you have seen Christ, then you have seen who? Then you have seen the Father. This was not slavery. This was an activity of what? Of love. Because he says in John 15, 9 and 10, if you go down, John 15, 9 and 10, he says that as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Continue in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my father's commandments 
and abide in his word, in his love. Jesus obeyed his father because he and his father always loved each other. He loved his father and was happy to obey him. And if we keep his commandments, we abide in his love. You cannot separate. Now, this is important to understand that you cannot separate love from the activity of what? Of love. If you love your children in the evening, you come home from work, you've bought them a gift. Let's say even if it is a, a, a biscuit or something, the kids will see that that is an activity of love. They will see that you love them, demonstrated by the buying of the, of the cookie. The same way you buy your wife a gift, he, she'll say, thank you, you do it. You love me. But it's the gift, the love. The gift is because of the love, but the gift is not, is not the love. So we cannot separate love from the activity of love. And that is why we are told if we keep his commandments, we abide in his word, in his love. The Lord has given us nice things to show his love for us. And we respond to his love by showing our love also for what? For him. We do things that please him because we do what? Because we love him. John 14, 21 said, where we were, go back to John 14, 21. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, 14, 21. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my father. And I will love him and will manifest myself to what? And I will manifest myself to him. The apostle John wrote more about this love than all the other apostles put together. And he makes it clear when he writes, if you jump to 1 John 5.3, 1 John 5.3, then we will read 1 John 2 also. Notice what this apostle says. 1 John 5.3. That for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not grievous. So the problem comes when we try to segregate love and the works of obedience, to separate them. But John says that that does not work very well. He says that it is because of our love for God that we keep his word, his commandments. This is the love of God that we keep his commandments. It shows that we love, we love God. It is because of our love for him that we actually keep him. It is all there together. The law is love and the law is the character of God. He makes this very obvious if you go to 1 John 2, 1 John 2, 3 to 6. 1 John 2, 3 to 6. He says, and hereby we do know that we know him. If we keep his commandments, he that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar. And the truth is not in him, but whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. He that saith he abideth in him, ought himself also so to walk, even as, even as he did what? as he walked. So if Christ has control of me and becomes king of my life, will he not make me do what he chooses? Not by force, but by what? But by love. How can I say that I abide in Christ and he in me if I do not do what he does? It is impossible. As soon as he changes my heart, I begin to do what he does because he is in charge and control of me. He has come to live inside of me. Now, these are the scriptures that we sometimes misunderstand and distort. We read this and we say that loving is keeping the commandments. I love you and I love the Lord. So everything is, is fine. I am keeping the commandments by having that love. And how do you separate these two things? At the same time, they say that the law has been done away by love. This is the balance that must come. Those who believe in the law also, on the other hand, on the other extreme, take the law to the other extreme and say that I keep the law and that proves my love to, 
to Christ. But it does not prove it. And this one, if you read the Bible, especially the history, not even the history, the Gospels, about the Jewish people when Christ was upon this earth, the Jews claimed that they kept the law and they are the same people who killed Christ. We can profess to keep the law, but then turn and fight each other and backbite each other and devour each other. And that is going to be good for the enemy as long as he's making sure that we do not uh, get this righteousness and sanctification through Christ. It is impossible for us to keep the first four commandments and to break the last six. How can we say that we do not steal from them, but then we destroy their reputations and characters by gossip? So these things, we have to look at them from the perspective given in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. When we read these uh, commands in context, because it is difficult for you to perceive that love is missing when you profess to keep the law. That you, you think that it is by keeping the law that shows how you love God. That is putting the cart before the water, before the horse. Jesus makes it a different thing by saying that when we love him, we love one another. And the activity of the last six commandments also becomes a word, becomes a reality. But if you just receive the law without Jesus and his love, then you will not become very, very loving. So we need to stop assuming that the keeping of the commandments is the one that establishes the love for, for Christ. That is not necessarily uh, true. We can talk about the requirements of God and the, and, 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 and the standards in the church and all these good things that are supposed to be the result. Yet, we might not be talking about love for who? For Christ. Christ does not love us because we obey him. He loves us in order that we might obey him. We do not show our love by keeping his requirements. We respond to his love, then we obey him. It is not these rules of life that he tells us to behold. We have said that in the uh, previous lessons. He does not say, behold my laws, and you will keep them. We might be able to see his love in his law and his character. That is not what we are to behold. He says we are to behold him. The author and finisher of our faith. This is the way that it is accomplished, that we will bear much fruit, that we will find the blessings of sanctification in his word. As we draw to a close, we want to look at two other quotes from steps to Christ. Steps to Christ, page 60. Steps to Christ, page 60. Where it says, obedience is not a mere outward compliance. Obedience is not a mere outward compliance. But the service of what? Of love. Now this alone should be able to turn our minds around. That we should be able to see the process, how, what comes before what. So that we do not get into these ideas that are not uh, biblical. Obedience is not a mere outward compliance, but the service of love. Obedience, the service and allegiance of love is the true sign of discipleship. So we are told here that obedience is what? Obedience is the service and allegiance of what? Of love. So what comes first? The love. We have to dwell in his love until we are transformed. Then we obey. And that is the true sign of what? Of discipleship. It is not mere outward compliance to the requirements of God. The Jews, we have said, claimed to keep the law. But all the time Christ was with them, they were disputing with Christ about what constitutes true law keeping. He heals someone on the Sabbath, he breaks the Sabbath law. He walks with his disciples and they harvest some husk, some whatever grains from the field. They claim that he is 
uh, permissive about Sabbath keeping. So Jesus also had answers for them from the Bible. And they had all kinds of conflicts with the master who actually wrote this law that they were arguing with over him throughout his life. Eventually, they even killed him. This proves that we can be law keepers and do the same thing if our obedience is a mere outward what? A mere outward compliance. Our hearts must be focused on Jesus and transformed by his love. I must receive the law in Christ and never apart from me. I think this is what we were supposed to be doing when we were told back then that we have preached the law until we are as dry as the hills of what? Of Gilboa. Christ is supposed to be returned into the law so that we, he can be preached in the law and received. The law must be received in Christ and never apart from him. He must come and abide in our hearts with his fullness, beauty, and glory. Then he will do something that changes us and makes us and makes it possible for us to obey and it is not the other uh, way around. The other quote is from Christ Object Lessons, page 312. Christ Object Lessons, page 312. By his perfect obedience, by his perfect obedience, He has made it possible for every human being to obey God's commandments. Yes. Very important because it is describing the steps that lead to sanctification in the study of God's word as we draw this to a close. That by his perfect obedience, he has made it possible for every human being to obey God's commandments. When we submit ourselves to Christ, the heart is united with his heart the will is merged in his will. The mind becomes one with his mind. The thoughts are brought into captivity to him. We live his life. This is what it means to be clothed with the garment of his righteousness. Then, as the Lord looks upon us, he sees not the fig leaf garment, not the nakedness and deformity of sin, but his own robe of righteousness, which is the perfect obedience to the law of of. God. So very interesting thoughts here. Remember it says when we submit ourselves to Christ. No wonder the relationship between Christ and his church is illustrated by that of marriage. And here you notice that it is men are told husbands love your wives and wives are told to do what? To submit it is difficult for men to understand what submitting entails. But here, when the church is compared to the bride, say to be the bride of Christ, then it means we must be able to submit to who? To Christ. Because Christ came and by his perfect obedience made it possible for every human being to obey the commandments of God. So when we look at Christ as our husband, we submit to him in love. We respect him. We give him our whole heart because we love him. We are devoted to him and we esteem him high. We give him our whole heart until we say, not our will, but your will be do what? Be done. Some Change must take place in us. We will be absorbed in him until our heart is entwined with his and we cannot think of any other thing except him, just like it happens in love between a man and a woman in marriage. So what happens when this happens? You find, by the way, I was looking at some I don't know if it was research or what. There, there were even times when there were photos of men who have been married for a long time. Even physically, they start looking what? They start looking alike. So what happens when a woman submits to the husband? In this case, when we submit to Christ, what happens is that the woman lives the life of the man. The woman will end up living the life of the man. Because the, the will of the woman 
will be wrapped up in the will of the man. Her heart is absorbed in him. Her whole mind will be absorbed in him. That that is what the lady will be thinking about all the day long. So this, we are told, is what happens when we study the word of God. You find Christ and he abides in us by his word. We read it in a different way. He jumps and leaps out at us. And we not only believe that he is good and loving, but we submit our wills to his. Our will accepts it. And we receive his word into our innermost soul. And when the heart is absorbed in him and our thoughts are consumed with him in his magnificent love, then we love him and then we will be able to live his light in us. The word sanctifies in that respect. It is because Christ is the epitome, the end of righteousness, the end of the law, that our union with him brings about that perfection, like we have quoted in that book quote from Christ's object lesson. His life will be reproduced in us. Whatever he is, he will make us to be as we are absorbed in him and enveloped in him and encompassed in him, filled with him. First Corinthians says that, but love never does what? Love never faileth. So God knew that what could be able to transform man is his quality of love, is his character of love. If you remove love from the God of the Bible as we know it, he ceases from being, from being that God. Read someone. So the, the God is love, and you cannot separate him from that love. And this was the greatest thing that he was going to use in order to win back man who had fallen into sin. He knew of a fact that love begets what? Begets love. So he bombarded us with love by sending his only son to die on the cross to us. And as we behold him, our hearts, even that of the most hardened criminal and sinner, must be able to be melted with his love. And as we respond, because we see ourselves crucifying our creator at the cross, something happens to us. When we submit our wills to his, we are able to obey and we are taken back to the point where Adam was before he actually fell into sin. What a marvelous person our God is. He wants us to see Jesus in the Bible and to fall in love with him absolutely and completely that you cannot think of another person. Until, like we saw the other time, Martha will complain that we are spending too much time sitting at the feet of Jesus because we have even put aside some of the things that people think are necessary and choose the good part of sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to his words, because that is the only way that we are going to be transformed, even through the power of the Holy Spirit. For me, to live is Christ, says Paul in the book of Philippians 1.21. This is not self-boasting, self but this is the condition in which we must be able to reach before Christ comes the second time. Remember that quote from Christ of the Blessings that when the character of God shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he shall come to claim them as his own. As his own. This is the message that Adventists we must be able to give to the world. We must be able to put Christ in the law, to put Christ in the prophecies, so that people will be able to respond out of love when they listen to the prophecies, when they listen to the fact that you are living at a time of investigative judgment. When we tell them that Christ is coming the second time, they should be able to wait eagerly for his return because it is somebody that they love, they would want to spend time with, and not because of fear that is coming with judgment. Those texts are there, yes, but what brings about a change in us so that we are obedient to the law of God is putting the horse before the cart, just like we have been trying to do so that we know that it is Christ who works in us and brings those changes. The part that we are supposed to do is what we have been looking. And today we'll be looking at sanctifying through the word, the part that the word has in our sanctification. And may God bless us as we continue 
in these studies in Jesus' name. I will pray before we get to comments and additions. Heavenly Father, once again, we are before you to thank you for the marvelous time that you have given us. Father, that we might be able to share freely from your word, because you have told us that a time is coming in which we might not be able to share freely out of your word. And Father, we pray that at this time, Father, may you open our minds, Father, that we might just drink deeply from the truths in your word. Father, that the promises might be fulfilled in us, that we might be able to live the life of Christ on this earth. Be with us as we continue with other programs during the day. For this, we pray, trusting and believing in the precious name of Christ. Amen.